So welcome everybody to uh, this acoustics lunchtime uh, seminar and we're very pleased to have Dr. Alinka Greasley here from the University of Leeds and she's going to talk about improving musical experiences for uh, hearing impaired listeners. Uh, I think her talk is based on a very interesting AHRC uh, funded project that uh, that she's been working on but it's of uh, it's of obvious sort of broad interest to uh, many of us working with acoustics i won't read out her abstract and bio because you can uh, see it in the in the chat of the meeting so um, so without further ado over to you Valenka. Okay, thank you very much. So, can you hear me okay and see my slides okay? Yep. All Perfect. good. Excellent. So, thank you for the invitation. Um, so, today I'm going to talk about the uh, Hearing Aids for Music project, um, which explored how hearing impairments and the use of hearing aid technology affect music listening behaviour through a series of um, survey and interview studies with hearing aid users and audiologists. Uh, the project mapped the benefits and the challenges of listening to music through hearing aids and also strategies used um, to help to improve uh, music listening experiences. So today I'm going to outline the project findings, uh, talk about how they've been uh, developed into a set of resources to, um, to help hearing aid users and, and audiology practitioners and then discuss uh, future directions. I just wanted to start with some quotes. These are from uh, some of the hearing aid users in our uh, study. I'll just give you a moment to, to read those. So participant one saying, I, I really miss music. I used to play, but I'm not able to do to do that anymore and, and how that makes them feel. Um, participant two saying music is distorted and lifeless, um, hence my infrequent attendance at, at live events when previously I was a regular attender. And then a performer at the bottom saying, you know, listening and playing often exhausts me when it used to energize me due mainly to the way that hearing aids amplify sound. We didn't actually have to look very far for these sorts of quotes. Actually, they're very common um, across the project. And it's it's these kind of experiences that we are um, uh, wanting to address in the work that we're doing. So in terms of the, the, the background content, well, people listen to a lot of music in their everyday lives, um, and, and this plays a key role in health and well-being. Um, so people use, we use music for functions such as um, pleasure, uh, relaxation, mood regulation um, and reminiscence. And there's also increasing evidence of um, uh, the psychological and uh, social benefits of musical participation. Now that's across all ages but there's an increasing focus on musical participation among older populations um, as, as, as playing a key role in, in their health and well-being as, as can be seen from um, initiatives such as social prescribing, um, you know, wherein <laughs> people experiencing psychological or physical distress are, are being referred to engage uh, in arts in the community. Despite these findings, there's actually um, limited um, uh, research evidence about music and deafness, which is which is quite surprising. At the start of the project, so this was back in 2015, there were really only a handful of studies. So Marshall Chasin had done some work looking at how hearing aids could be programmed for music. Robert Fulford um, had done, he was doing some work with deaf musicians looking at how they perform with other deaf musicians and hearing musicians. Um, he found that the musicians reported that hearing aids were, um, I quote, both a blessing and a curse. So they enable uh, performance to happen, but um, often made the sound distorted. 
there was an early interview study with some elderly people, an elderly population by Lee Catal, and then a, a survey study by Madsen and Moore in, in 2014. These are kind of the main studies that have actually been conducted. And what that final survey uh, showed was um, that there were problems, uh, while hearing aids were reported to be helpful, there were problems with distortion um, and also feedback. So because of this uh, limited evidence, we got together, myself, Harriet Crook and Robert Fulford got together a, a project and we applied to the HRC for funding. Harriet Crook in the middle there at the top um, is an audiologist with expertise in music. And as I've just described, Robert Fulford was doing some work at the Royal Northern College of Music, um, looking at um, deaf musicians' musical performance. So, um, yeah, we got this together. It was a collaboration uh, between Sheffield Teaching Hospitals and also Harley Street Hearing um, uh, in London because we wanted to ensure that we had insights from both um, public and private audiological practice. As it turned out, actually, I was uh, blessed with uh, three postdocs on the project. So you can see at the top there, um, uh, as well as Harriet and then Robert, uh, who, was, who was the first postdoc. Um, there was Jackie Salter and also Amy Beeston. And then I also worked with an advisory board um, who were spread across a range of disciplinary areas. So Lena Barcher on the bottom left, uh, hearing therapist Guy Brown at Sheffield, computer science, Paul Checkley in the middle there, um, he's a clinical director at Harley Street. Um, Brian Moore, uh, who's a professor of auditory perception at Cambridge. Um, Ruth Swanick, Professor Ruth Swanick, who's um, uh, in de deaf education at Leeds. And then bottom right is Paul Whitaker, uh, himself a, a, a profoundly deaf musician. So this really was a collaborative endeavour. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the hundreds of um, hearing aid users and audiologists we worked with as well. So uh, what are the project aims? Well, to understand how different levels of hearing impairment, the use of hearing aid technology affects music listening behaviour, to understand the benefits and challenges of listening to music through hearing aids, to explore the strategies that have been used by audiologists in clinic to address musical needs, and then to develop guidance to help improve access to music for people with all levels of deafness. Now, I just want to sort of, you know, emphasise all levels of deafness. Accessibility was at the heart of the project. Um, we provided um, sign language where that was needed. And when we did our national survey, we translated all of the survey questions into BSL videos um, to ensure that everyone who wanted to take part could take part. And I think around 7% of our large, our sample in the large survey uh, used those videos. So it's a very, very beneficial thing to do. Um, but yeah, putting, putting hearing aid users, it's kind of voices at the, the heart of what we're doing. So we carried out, uh, well, five research studies. It was three as it was originally written into the grant, um, but we um, added in an audiology survey and we also did a resource evaluation study recently, um, uh, which I'm gonna, well, We'll talk you through these. I can't cover, obviously can't cover all of the project findings, so I'm going to briefly describe each study um, and, and, and the kind of key findings from them, and then I'll move into a broader discussion of the challenges and potential solutions for improving uh, music listening experiences. So to start off with, um, we did a clinical survey uh, this was designed to be completed quickly in the waiting room. It was like paper based um, and um, patients as they came in and waited for their hearing appointment could just fill it out quickly or they could take one away and then send it back in a, a stamped address envelope. And this simply asked about, you know, did they have any problems with music? If so, what were they? Um, and, uh, you know, whether they'd had any discussions with their audiologists about music as well. So just a, a, a scoping survey, if you like. Uh, roughly half of the sample, as you can see here, um, uh, were recruited at Sheffield and then half in the private clinic. So we asked, you know, do you experience problems with music? We can see from this graph on the left here that around 15% reported that they um, not at all did they experience any problems. 
the modal response was four, so that was sometimes experienced problems. And as you can see, there's a, a sort of trend towards the, the higher ratings. So there's 67% experiencing problems at least sometimes. 76 responded to an open-ended question. And you can see here the, the, the main problems that were articulated by the hearing aid users um, the, were pitch perception difficulties, um, difficulties in live context, uh, audibility issues, issues with dynamics, problems hearing lyrics and um, distortion. You can see there and I've just got a few of the sort of sorts of typical quotes that we got on these um, surveys there. So uh, obviously an indication that there are there are problems with music listening. Well, we then asked them, you know, does this affect your quality of life? And um, as you can see from the graph on the left here, um, the most frequent response was not at all, um, which was good. Um, but um, there, there are responses across um, the range, um, the, the, the rest of the um, responses there. So it's a bit of a bit of a, a mixed um, picture. And um, the most frequent sort of uh, reasons given for uh, the, the problems with music affecting life, um, uh, quality of life was a, um, a loss of enjoyment and associated frustration with that, uh, stopping listening or attending to concerts and sort of, you know, the, the, the negative impact that that has on uh, mental health and also feeling socially excluded. So people reporting um, that they weren't able to um, perform anymore. They didn't feel confident enough to perform or they couldn't join in, you know, when they were, you know, when they were singing in, in church or so look, quite a few accounts of um, this, this impact on, on quality of life. We then asked, you know, have you ever had a discussion with your audiologist about music? Um, over a hundred, so I think 58% had not. Um, and of the ones who had had discussions, we asked, you know, has this improved your experience of music? And you can see from this second graph on the on the right that there was quite mixed responses to that question, uh, with the, the the modal response being not at all. That the the kind of attempts to work um, work through any problems with music listening had not had not been successful in the clinical appointment. But I must point out at this stage that's not because the audiologist has necessarily been unhelpful. It's just that the um, discussions or the strategies that were used um, did not result in, in, in positive outcomes uh, for music listening. So here we've got, if we just take this first quote, um, it was about a chap sort of saying, you know, talking about uh, repeated visits to the audiologist and the audiologist spending time experimenting, um, but there still being a kind of fine margin between it, it being okay and not i.e. Whether, whether he's experiencing feedback in um, live music context and then you know this 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 uh, quote at the bottom really sums it up uh, the problems I have seem to be an unsolvable problem in otherwise excellent hearing aids i.e. my hearing aids are great for speech um, but they're just still problematic uh, for music so they were the sort of key findings from what was a um, you know quite a, a small scale study of just asking a few questions and it sort of dawned on us that you know if we were asking the hearing aid users about their discussions with audiologists we should probably be asking the audiologists as well um, so we um, so we constructed a, a survey um, to ask audiologists to reflect on their training and background their experiences of discussing music in clinic um, and their experiences of, of, of programming hearing aids for music and their confidence in their ability to do so. We had a mixture of uh, public and private sector audiologists, so about two thirds were working in the NHS um, and about a third in, in the private sector, roughly. Um, and uh, they'd been practicing, uh, around half had been practicing for more than 10 years and around a third had only been practicing for a few years. So there was a, a range of experience um, among the practitioners. And I haven't pulled out all the findings here, but just the ones that I think are, 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 are relevant. So 
we asked them if they were having discussions about music, uh, like the hearing aid users, they said that there, there weren't many uh, discussions taking place. So the graph on the left shows the percentage of patients who ask about music. So that's predominantly one in 10. Um, the audiologists set, report that they ask patients about music more often than patients ask. And that's what the graph on the right hand side um, shows. But that's still, it's still sort of one in five um, uh, or less where um, audiologists are asking about patients. So clear asking about music. So clearly more discussions about music could be taking place, um, though it's acknowledged that there are time constraints in clinical appointments. Uh, we asked what topics were covered when music was discussed. Uh, the um, top topics came out as listening uh, it's listening to speakers at home and playing an instrument with sort of phone apps and direct streaming, um, not discussed as much. But uh, I'd say these results overall show that there's no um, no sort of one topic being routinely discussed. We asked uh, audiologists to rate the usefulness of hearing aids for music listening, and um, this was these were their responses. Um, so the majority, 68%, responded sometimes useful, sometimes not. So reflecting the sentiment from the hearing aid users themselves, only a very small percentage uh, reporting that they felt that hearing aids were often or very useful for music. We asked whether they felt confident in providing advice about music and in optimising a hearing aid uh, for music listening. The majority uh, just under 60% reported some confidence, uh, while around a quarter were not sure and 17% were reluctant. A similar pattern was found regarding the confidence in programming a hearing aid for music. So over half reporting that they were confident, but a quarter not sure. And 18% were reluctant or would not attempt this at all. So interesting there. So while there is some confidence, there's also um, um, a, a sort of reluctance to um, engage in fitting fitting hearing hearing aids for music. One of the reasons for this could be that um, audiologists don't actually get any training on the subject of music formally um, within their degree as a rule. Some have um, some training on one module, uh, perhaps one module um in on, on their undergraduate or their master's degree but mainly any training that they did have was through conference presentations or continuing professional development or perhaps a manufacturer led workshop so nothing formal within within their degree but but stuff that they've um, um picked up as a result of sort of you know um, conference attendance and, and so on. So you know, perhaps it's not surprising given that they don't have any formal training um, in music perception that, uh, it, you know, that they're, they're not feeling particularly confident um, within the clinic. Um, those who were able to report on the strategies that they used, so this was about half of the sample who responded to, to this question. Um, you know, detailed a number of strategies um, that they use uh, in order to improve uh, listening experiences. The most common strategy used, well, reported by four of the four out of five of, of the audiologists responding to this question, was disabling automatic functions for speech perception. So that includes um, noise management, um, feedback management, and microphone directionality. Uh, so there are specific reasons for this. So um, uh, disabling the feedback manager uh, prevents pure tone musical stimuli from um, being mistakenly analysed as, as feedback and suppressed. Uh, same with noise reduction. Um, so the rationale is to um, avoid musical stimuli being interpreted as noise um, uh, and again being being reduced. Um, uh, and then microphone directionality. Um, there's sort of a small amount of evidence that that turning that off and choosing fixed directionality is um, good for music listening, um, and helps music music listeners to um, sort of identify musical features. But 
there needs to be a lot more research um you know in into these strategies so we're, it's really not much out there the second most common strategy was adjusting compression characteristics um though the detail that we got on the survey tended to be quite vague um so it was just sort of like change compression settings or changing compression type so it didn't really say much about whether it was referring to um compression speeds um or or, or linear and non-linear strategies and so th there was a, there was a sort of detail missing that didn't really enable us to um uh, uh, fully understand what was what the strategies that, that they were using um uh, were so other responses focused on sort of changes to gain frequency response and maximum power output as you can see there some talked about using the manufacturer bespoke music program so actually just setting the music program on on the hearing aids and i'll come back to the issue of music programs a bit later on um the it was interesting that uh, quite a few of them said taking individual differences into account um so the the, the need to uh, really understand patient histories, um, their musical background, their preferences, their listening habits, um, whether they play an instrument, you know, the kind of performance settings um, that they're operating in. Um, but that takes time. Um, it's something um, uh, that was highlighted in our, um, uh, well, throughout the project was, you know, often the best results are coming after um, multiple visits to the audiologist and um, uh, experimentation over, over a period of, uh, of time. So, uh, and then just, yeah, I'll just give you an example of some of the survey responses there um, about the sorts of adaptations uh, the audiologists make. So that was the audiology survey. Uh, we then conducted an interview study um, and we had 22 in total. We um, tried to get um, a mixture of musicians and non-musicians and then also um, sort of hearing loss level groups in uh, rough proportion to what we might find in, um, uh, in society in general. We asked about their hearing loss, uh, their music listening practices, how their hearing loss had affected um, listening over time and about their experiences of, of, of hearing aid fitting. We also um, got audiometric data uh, to verify hearing level and um, to aid in the interpretation of the hearing aid users accounts. Um, so uh, yeah, this was really in depth in in detail work um i'm not going to be able to uh, do do it justice um in a few slides uh but just to say that a lot of the difficulties that were expressed previously um in the first scoping study uh were articulated again here by the hearing aid users so things like distortion um particularly at high frequencies um when the music was loud uh, feedback, experiencing feedback, uh, issues with um, poor uh, poor tone quality, um, pitch perception issues and problems following lyrics. And then um, in particular problems in live context. However, uh, some people didn't support, di didn't report significant issues. Um, so there were some that, that you know, just were, were saying that they, they helped. I think that's important to remember. I think we can be a bit bit focused on the uh, the negatives, but um, there were uh, there were some who uh, found their hearing is very very helpful, and um, those tended to be in the mild and moderate hearing loss groups. There was some indication across the participants that as hearing aid technology had advanced, um, actually there'd been improvements um, in in their listening experiences. Uh, and some reported the, the the role of familiarity with music in facilitating appreciation. This sort of sense of well, I know how it sounds, I can fill the gaps in. But actually, that was also <laughs> um, also you know it, it was a negative experience as well. Like I know how it should sound, um, and it doesn't sound like that. So um, familiarity is sort of 
um, was, was reported to be both a positive and a negative influence on, on listening experiences. Um, so here's some positive quotes. Uh, so the first two are from participants with a, a moderate loss. So saying, you know, they do improve it without w without them. There's there's nothing there. I just hear a thump, thump, thud bits of the track. Um, you know, if you take a guitar solo, I wouldn't be able to hear it without my hearing aids. Um, and then a, 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 another lady said I used to struggle to pick out the instruments. Now, if I've got my hearing aids, I can I can hear the instruments coming in. Um, and then someone with a, a, a mild hearing loss at the bottom here saying so if I would probably give them a nine out of ten. I used to struggle, but I can I can hear the words clearer. So there were there were the positive um, uh, experiences um, within the data set. Hearing aids are not problematic for uh, for, for everyone. Um, what a situation that did transpire to be. Uh, repeatedly difficult for people was was live context um, as, as opposed to recorded. So they were sort of saying in a recorded music context, I've got more control. I can I can control the volume. I can control the mode of delivery. We've got the properties of music of, of, of recorded music as well, um, which the, the, the hearing aid is, is is able to cope better with. Um, and also the kind of familiarity which comes with with listening to your own music in your own context, be it at home or, or in the car. Whereas live music contexts were reported to be much more problematic um, uh, due to the to, to the, the loudness, um, uh, the sound levels being controlled by by others, whether it's in a sort of pub or a venue, like a musical stage. Um, Lots of accounts of um, high, high high pitches distorting um, feedback in those situations, and then also problems with um, uh, music and speech. So that sort of shifting between the music, um, um, and then the the artist might might talk between songs, for example, and then that becomes um, problematic. So uh, yeah, so live context uh, definitely coming out as. Um, um, a, a key area of, of, of concern for people. Um, with, you know, just there are lots of results I, I could have brought in here, um, just just to kind of talk a, a bit about the way that people are kind of negotiating their spaces and get, get having strategies for um, uh, kind of where they are within a within a, within a musical event and um, uh, whether they've got their hearing aids in or they take them out or whether they take the hearing aids out and put hearing protection in. It's a, a, a constant sort of judgment as to what they need to be doing uh, for the best for their musical experience in, in that situation. Um, I think this is a this is a, a good a good example here. If I'm playing classical guitar, it's quiet. Um, but it comes out quite loud, slightly distorted, so I turn it down. If I go to concerts, it's awful if it's distorted, so I wait for the first loud bit and then adjust the volume. And then if in a jazz club, um, they, they, they choose to stick the instruments through an amplifying system, I, I actually take my hearing aids out altogether. So there were lots of accounts like this about the way in which um, the listeners are sort of negotiating their everyday situations um, to to kind of um, improve improve their uh, musical experiences. There's <clears throat> there's a, a, a range of other um, sort of key findings coming from the interview study um, in relating to sort of listeners knowledge of their hearing loss and the implications of the hearing loss, um, the knowledge of the hearing aid technology itself and how it works or um, what assistive listening devices there might be um, that they could use with the hearing aids. Uh, there were differences in acclimatisation, um, which was somewhat related to mindset as well. Um, so some people are just saying, well, you know, I've got this loss, I need to stick them in, I need to get on with it, even if it doesn't sound very good, I need to um, I need to, to persevere. Uh, whereas others um, 
uh, really, you know, struggling with um, uh, struggling to, to to sort of come to terms with with their their new new sort of sound world. Um, there were also differences in um, participants' ability to discuss music in clinic, uh, and, and in the interview, indeed. So some people just say, "Oh, I don't." Just it sounds off. I don't really know how to describe it, but it, it just sounds. Um, it's yeah, sounds off, or it, it sounds mushy. I don't. That, that was that was a word that came out um, a few times. It just sounds mushy. Whereas the musicians were able to be um, much more specific about the problems that they were having and were often um, quite clued up about the hearing aid technology itself. So, as I say, I'm, I'm going to move on just 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 for time, but there are, there are lots of kind of other findings in the interview um, uh, study that um, are, are sort of relevant here. Um, moving on to the online survey, uh, this was a, 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 a bigger endeavour, so this was kind of moving away from the individual, individual approach to looking at a large cohort of um, hearing aid users and establishing what, what the problems um, that they experience are. Um, so we asked about uh, questions to do with listening habits, hearing level um, and the use of hearing aid technology, uh, their experiences of, of music in live and recorded settings and also about their discussions with audiologists. We recruited these through lots of different mailing lists, music mailing lists, um, uh, audiology mailing lists. Um, we also recruited through the NHS and we got a lot of NHS trusts on board um, to, to help us with recruitment. I think um, I think there are something like I don't know about about 350 or so who were recruited through NHS trusts for this particular survey, and there are about possibly 10% of people who filled it out were international, and 90% were um, were were UK based. Uh, and as I said previously, we um, we we translated the. Uh, we translated the questions into to, to BSL and to, to make sure that the survey was was fully accessible. OK, so so what did we find? Um, well, we asked them about how important music was to them, um, you know, how often they listen, whether they've got a large collection, whether they like talking to people about music. So it's just a sort of questions about you know, how much they're engaging um, with music listening. And um, I'd say this was a lot if we add those up. Um, uh, their scores for the different types of engagement. We can see here that there's there's, there's generally um, a skew towards uh, the sample being highly engaged. Some of that might be, you know, a bit of bias. They, you know, they're, they're taking part in a study on music. That's probably because they've got some interest in music. But um, I think, you know, there's an important message here um, that you know, is is that that the people with 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 um, all levels of deafness are still engaging with music? We kind of assume that they might not engage with music, but that but they are and they want to. So um, this was in contrast to musical training. So that the musical training levels um, uh, among the sample were low, and there was around 330 who had never had any kind of. Um, um, tuition at school or instrumental lesson or sung in a in a in a group or or, or anything so um we we're going to take these groups um who've got absolutely no training and those with the the highest level of training and do some analyses on these to see um to see what the patterns of of, of difference are um so we've got a, a group that aren't particularly highly musically trained but are very engaged in listening they are um, uh, listening to recorded music uh, with their hearing aids. You can see here the sort of overall stats. Um, we've got 878 who who are, um, and then the 29, the 297 um, who are um, listening at least at least sometimes. Now at this point in the survey, actually, we um, you know it was um, those who said that they didn't listen to recorded music then were did not carry on and answer the questions on recorded music so some of the numbers vary at this point so they go down from 
um, uh, sort of 1400 to in places eight or 900, and that's just because of the, 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 the survey logic. But overall, listening to a lot of recorded music and overall um, actually attending um, live events fairly regularly. So we asked them about, um, you know, when you're listening to recorded music, how how helpful um, are your hearing aids? Um, what we found um, was that well, was quite pleasing, really, um, is that as you can see from the from the blue um, the blue line there, that um, it's you know predominantly very helpful um, for hearing aids were rated as predominantly helpful for uh, hearing out the melody. Um, the bass line, the singer, the lyrics and the instruments in recorded settings. Um, if you then look at live settings, we can see that the pattern is slightly different. So for the melody and the singer, we've still got sort of very helpful as the most or, or fairly helpful as the most frequent responses. If you look on the right hand side of the graph here, the lyrics and the instruments, um, we've got the lower rankings are much higher up. So um, people reporting, um, you know, that the, there's there's more problems in live context with being able to understand the lyrics um, and and being able to uh, pick out instruments. So those those kind of the percentage of helpfulness goes down in live context for those particular um, uh, elements or hearing out those particular elements. Um, we then asked about difficulties experienced um, when listening to recorded music and you know, pleasingly the response was never for most of the, um, you know, for most of the different categories, so too much bass, um, too much treble, feedback and so on. That's indicated by the blue line there, but that wasn't the case for distortion. Um, so distortion is happening with 61% like um, report that they're experiencing it at least sometimes so when they're getting kind of you know, artifacts that aren't in the the, the, sort of the, the original signal. Um, and that's at, that's at home when listening to recorded music and that's actually then um, worse in live context. So even more distortion um, being experienced. And there's a slightly different pattern of, of results here um, with feedback and sudden changes in loudness. It's still very much the case um, that, that people are not experiencing that um, frequently. Um, but there are there are some people, there are more people or a higher percentage who are experiencing um, discomfort from uh, from from loud sounds. So there's a sort of pattern emerging here, um, which is summarised quite nicely by um, the rated helpfulness of hearing aids. So we said to them, you know, how helpful are your hearing aids in a recorded um, music setting? How helpful are they in a live context? And we can see here uh, the results of that. Um, and we can see that for recorded, um, there's a higher percentage um, in the, you know, the, the higher ratings. Whereas for live, there's the higher percentage of the two. Uh, for those who responded to both questions, this is for the, um, um, you know, for the for, for the experience in the in the live context. Um, so really, just sort of underlining um, what, what we're finding throughout about um, the, the need to sort of look at these differently. Um, thinking about differences by hearing level, um, we found that the more severe the hearing loss um, the, the the less likely um, the individuals were to rate hearing aids as helpful for hearing lyrics and picking out instruments um, in a recorded context but there was no significant difference for hearing out the melody bass line and singer with regards to difficulties in recorded contexts the greater the hearing loss the more likely they were to experience distortion and also too much bass um, in live contexts, the greater the hearing loss, the less likely they were to rate hearing uh, hearing aids as helpful for hearing out a number of different um, musical elements. And then again, we've got the same problems um, in terms of the difficulties experienced. There were there were significant differences um, in in their 
experience of distortion and too much bass. Um, there were also differences in musical preferences. Um, so overall, as a sample, there were strong preferences for classical, both chamber and orchestral, uh, for blues, choral and rock. They were the four most uh, preferred musical styles, but there were significant differences in preference for styles among the severe and the profound for four um, for particular musical styles. These were we, these were the only significant differences found, and these were all essentially classical music. And it's to do with the the, the complexity of the music. And if we have a look at some of the qualitative responses, uh, as you can see here. Um, we can um, uh, we can see why this is. Uh, any music with lots of instruments is harder than solo singer or player. Uh, single instruments are easier to appreciate than orchestral or choral. Um, I find it hard to differentiate sounds in the grand orchestral music and prefer chamber for that for that reason. So when people got up to sort of um, moderate, well, severe, moderate and severe, but certainly profound. Um, the ability to appreciate classical music was significantly reduced. And this was um, uh, uh, this was shown in uh, preference for musical features to some degree as well. Um, the more severe the hearing loss, the less important. Uh, for example, instrumentation and harmony became to the individual in shaping um, their musical preferences. And again, um, the, the open ended responses on the survey uh, really supported that um, uh, those those problems with those particular um, musical features, as you can see here, um, difficulties picking out instruments, hearing vocal lines. Particularly the lyrics, which are often um, uh, reported to be uh, in, indistinguishable um, within music. OK, I feel like I've done a, a really kind of a whistle stop tour of uh, uh, those four studies there, but I just want to kind of broaden out now and um, just uh, have a look at the kind of the, the, the bigger picture. So why are there these overarching problems? Why are um, these hearing impaired listeners ha having, you know, having problems with music? Well, um, first is the perceptual consequences of hearing loss from music. So, you know, with or without hearing aids, um, the hearing loss fundamentally changes perceptions. Um, and I'd refer, uh, I'd refer you to uh, an excellent paper by uh, Brian Moore on this, and he sort of sets out what the uh, perceptual consequences of hearing loss for music are. And you can see some of the things that the, 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 the participants are saying to us about sort of issues with audibility, um, um, you know, pitch perception problems, um, difficulties hearing out instruments, you know, can be explained um, uh, by the hearing loss itself. Um, related to that, there's also a uh, poor understanding of hearing loss among some hearing aid users. Uh, so, um, you know, people just not, not, not really knowing what their, um, you know, um, moderate high frequency loss might mean for them or, or their severe high frequency loss. So if, if there's a musician, for example, and they say, OK, well, I'm, um, I'm not I'm not getting um, I'm not getting some of the piccolo or, you know, I, I can't hear the cymbal, uh, but I know I've got a sort of a, a, um, severe loss in, in the um, high frequencies. So they kind of put two and two together and go, oh, well, that'll be why. But a lot of hearing aid users sort of knew that they were having problems with music, but didn't really understand why. Um, there was also sort of differences in understanding of what the hearing aid technology could bring to the situation. Um, so there was this sort of expectation that you put the hearing aids on and their music listening would be back to normal, a bit like sort of putting glasses on. Um, but but, you know, that's not that's not the case with hearing. And I think there was a sort of mismatch and sort of mis expectation sometimes from the participants about what the what the hearing aid technology could 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 actually do for their hearing. A second overarching problem is that the, the hearing aids are designed for, for speech. 
Um, so the acoustical properties of music and speech are different, uh, you know, dynamic range, uh, frequency range and hearing aids haven't been designed with, with music in mind. There's evidence that music programmes within the hearing aids do not provide sufficient benefit. So within our um, large scale survey, we asked people, do you have a music programme? Around a third did. And then we say, you know, how frequently do you use? your music program and it was it was quite mixed um uh we've you know got maybe around half using their music program at least occasionally but then the results about the efficacy of the music program in improving things are really really mixed and mostly probably mostly um well, as, as I put on the slide, like there were some really positive uh, accounts. I, I, I had a music program fitted and it just it revolutionised my listening experience and I'm not having any problems anymore through to this is absolutely awful. It makes it makes music worse. Um, but then a lot of people who are in the middle who are sort of saying, I don't really notice when I've got the music program on. I, I can't tell the difference between the music program. And, um, and and my normal program, so it does suggest that you know that, that they're not they're not beneficial in the way that they they need to be, um, and actually more recent studies. Um, so um, just we've got a couple down there by Valerie Loy um, and um, Jonathan Weisberg et al. Uh, they've also found recently that a music program um, was reported to to provide little or no benefit. So there's some improvements to be made there. There's also a lack of research on um, signal processing for music. Uh, so again, there's some handful of studies. And it really is just a handful of studies. Um, some showing that sort of slow acting uh, dynamic range compression and linear amplification produces higher preference for classical or um, uh, that a linear amplification may um, enable hearing aid users to pick out individual instruments um, um, uh, more successfully um, than in, in, in other um, sort of slow or fast acting compression situations. And then there's a couple of recent studies, um, Remy Marchand and again Jonathan Weisberg over in the US that have um, looked at or have shown that hearing impaired listeners preferred gain with low frequency emphasis and reduction in high frequency gain um, and then also that compression ratios were higher um, for kind of music enjoyment. So there's some studies that are now starting to come out but overall there's a need for more systematic research into signal processing parameters that could potentially benefit um, music listening. A third problem is that audiologists are not trained in addressing musical needs in clinic. Um, you know, they, they don't have training. Like some of them may have done a module on, on their uh, degree course, but they're really coming at this unless they're musician themselves, they have a musical background or some sort of, you know, audio engineering or music technology background. You know they're not tuned into the the the, the particular um, uh, uh, you know the, the, the particular problems that might be um, uh, occurring for musicians in particular. There's a lack of research into fitting strategies um, and then the outcomes of music listening. So that's really urgent work that needs doing. I mean the survey uh, with the audiologists. It um, uh, you know it was it they weren't really able to go in into any great detail um, and, and so we didn't get a lot of what I was saying before about you know change compression settings well in what way it was just quite generalized and so actually talking to the audiologists I think about you know what strategies they're using and trying to build up an evidence base for successful outcomes um, would be um, a, a good a good next step. So in terms of solutions, maybe maybe the solutions isn't the right word, um, but kind of ways to improve. Um, certainly, I think you know we could do more to um, increase awareness of the consequences of hearing loss for music and of the, the sort of limitations of hearing aid technology among hearing aid users. So sort of managing expectations. 
Um, we can definitely encourage more discussions about music in clinic. I think that, you know, this needs to be a joint endeavour. The patient needs to ask, but also the audiologist needs to ask, given how important As I've just said, engaging audiologists in reflection on their practice, um, developing this sort of evidence-based research, linking particular strategies to listening outcomes, and then improving the hearing aid technology itself. So we need to understand more about the signal processing solutions that might be beneficial for music. We need to understand what's going on in the music programmes and how we might improve them. Um, sort of manufacturer sensitivity, um, it is, is a, a key issue there. And then also um, perhaps the machine learning approaches um, that are being used and being introduced um, on, on some level with some manufacturers um, uh, to sort of build up a profile of uh, the listener. I think that at the moment um, they're doing things like sort of kind of pairwise comparisons to uh, get a sense of uh, of what the listener wants and which settings are better within particular situations and then um, uh, learning about those preferences over time that could be introduced um, uh, for, for music in some way um, and I think you know work in that area is, is not you know is, is is starting to is starting to take off um, so that's kind of um, ways of improving we in order to um, uh, to kind of use the project findings as, as, as fully as, as, as possible. We've developed some uh, resources. I've just got, got some of them here now. We've, de we've developed a, um, um, a leaflet for patients um, to help them to understand about their hearing loss and, and why music is challenging, um, how their hearing aids can help and how they can best get um, um, you know, how they can go about having conversations with their audiologist um, with some kind of top tips for music listening. We've also developed um, resources for audiologists uh, as well. So um, a sort of main counselling and, and, and fitting leaflet about sort of taking histories and uh, fitting hearing aids for music and um, doing audibility checks and things like occlusion for, for singers and, and, and players. And then also um, a, a more um, tailored one, which is about starting out with a, a music programme, because there's definitely things that can be done and changed within the music programme um, uh, to um, improve that the experience um, of that for, for the listeners. Um, so yeah, so we've developed these and then we've started a, a resource impact study to actually have a look at how beneficial beneficial these are for um, for audiologists. And we just started that when COVID hit. So we managed to get about uh, you know six interviews and 20, 20 people reflecting on them before um, we had to stop sending them out. But we will be resuming that um, as, as soon as possible. So uh, last slide, um, I've gone on a bit slightly longer than I'd, I'd, I'd expected, but we should have a few a a few few um, uh, minutes for questions. Just ending on a high note, um, some positives. There's lots of musical engagement among hearing impaired listeners. Hearing aids do help um, despite the difficulties. Audiologists are really keen to engage with the materials and to learn more about what the research shows. Um, and there's, there's evidence that the leaflets are making a difference to clinical practice already, kind of just raising awareness of um, the challenges with music and the things that can be done and the, the, what the strategy, the fitting strategies that can be uh, tried out. Um, and, um, you know, the effect that it's had on patients and practitioners already has, has, has led it to being um, both a, a REF impact case study, but also um, an NHS NIHR impact case study as well for the work that we've done with practitioners. So that's really positive. And then also we've got lots of avenues um, for future research here um, as well. OK, that's it from me. Um, has anybody got any questions? That was splendid, Alinka. Thanks very much.